All right, folks, welcome to The Ticking Clock. I'm Jonathan Mayberry. For those who don't know me, a real brief background, I'm a New York Times bestselling author of over 40 novels, 130 some short stories, and a bunch of other stuff, including comic books for Marvel and other companies. Um, I write in a number of different genres, and all of them require a story that, that unfolds at a fast pace. So we're going to talk about, about that. And there's a bunch of different things to, to uh, talk about with that. Now, this is recorded, so you can, you know, you'll be able to watch it later. Uh, I don't give specific notes. Uh, this is something I mentioned to my uh, class yesterday. Um, I was the kind of student who took the notes that mattered to me. So I want to let you take the notes that matter to you. If you have follow-up questions, however, you can reach me via email, Jonathan underscore Mayberry, spell my last name right, M-A-B-E-R-R-Y at yahoo.com, or message me uh, through uh, any of the uh, services like, like uh, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Uh, if you have writing questions of, you know, related to this, feel free to reach out because 45 minutes isn't enough time to cover everything, but we'll get to a bunch of stuff. So uh, let's dive right in. So when they talk about the ticking clock, um, it's a kind of a nod back to the old movie serials where there was actually a time bomb about to go off. And, you know, whether it's trying to find that time bomb and, and you know, uh, just simply unplug it or in later stories, actually having to defuse the bomb, which I always found a riot because like defusing a nuclear bomb, they don't actually have digital timers on them to tell you how, how soon it's going to blow up. They just pretty much use internal clocks and blow the hell up. But in the movies, they, they, they do that silly thing of actually saying it. It's always down to the last two seconds. Our, this genre of writing, this type of writing, tick, the ticking clock thing, is based on a cliche that's so corny that please, for the love of God, never use it. Don't actually have a ticking clock. Um, don't actually have a fuse running that somebody has to, has to run and, and chase and cut off just when there's an inch left before the bomb. Don't do the expected in ticking clocks. Um, the ticking clock is implied. The exception would be in a thriller, if you want to actually put some sort of a, of a countdown to an event, I recommend putting something at the chapter headings. Um, I did one in one book, Extinction Machine. There was actually uh, an extinction clock that was ticking down, but it was at the beginning of each chapter. It was not a physical thing they were trying to find. It's just telling the reader that they now have less time in this chapter than the last, and, and time is burning off really quickly. That's a device that is as close to the ticking clock as you can get without it becoming cliche. So I recommend something like that if you're writing a thriller. Um, pace is one of the most important things in, in, in thrillers or any kind of a story that has high stakes and a, and a need to do something by the end of the book. And thrillers, by the way, are not always um, what you might think. I mean, a lot of romances are actually thrillers. There was a movie, I think it was called Serendipity with John Cusack, where he had to, um, you know, find some, get to a, a bridge at a certain, or an ice skating ring or something at a certain point um, to meet a girl that, that he loves. And is he going to get there in time? Um, in, uh, in another John Cusack movie, Say Anything, he had to try to win the love of a certain uh, girl from high school by the end of the movie. And there are a number of other things like that. Um, so it, it, ticking clocks can be implied in a number of different stories. When we're talking about pace, though, um, that's a really key thing, in, especially in thrillers, because we want the story to unfold in the shortest possible time frame. Um, we want it to unfold. You know, when we write it, we want it you know, to have that, that race against time thing. Um, you know, we see it in our plots. We try to build it into our plots for those who plot. I don't know. Not everyone is a plotter. I am. I'm a card carrying plotter. Um, but we, we, you know, when we're conceiving the story, we want to try to get it in the shortest time frame as possible. So it has that sense of urgency. Um, <clears throat> in draft, you know, as, as we write it, we're trying to, to build it. So it, it, it seems like things are accelerating toward, you know, that inevitable thing that we're trying to either trying to prevent or in some cases trying to accomplish the race for a cure, um, the, the race to find evidence in a legal thriller. You know, sometimes it's not a bad thing they're trying to find. It's a good thing to prevent a bad thing. You know, <clears throat> most often we really get to our exciting pace for these things in revision. 
And I love the revision uh, process. You have the first draft done. And by the way, if you've completed the first draft, go buy yourself a present because you've accomplished something most people never actually do, finishing a first draft. When that draft is done, I recommend spending a little time being you know, distant from it and then go back and reread it while making notes, not while making changes. You want to go through and, and read the whole thing and get a sense of how exciting the story unfolds to you who already knows it. Then with your notes, go, go through it and maybe do a, um, a chronology adjustment so that if the story unfolds over seven days, can it unfold under four? Can it unfold under three? What's the shortest period of time that you can get the story in while at the same time, you know, fleshing out the characters, making the story as real as possible, giving those moments that, that enrich the reading experience? But you do want to try to get it as soon uh, in as short a period of time as possible. Almost all of my Joe Ledger thrillers, which are my main thriller series, um, winds up being shorter and finer final draft in terms of the time of the story, not word count. The time the story takes place shorter in final draft than it is usually in my original draft. Sometimes in my plots, I'll give a story five days and think, "Wow, that's a whole bunch of time." And then I realized that, you know, the story really deals with special ops uh, guys in the field dealing with the big bad. Five days is, is, is a vacation for special operators. They want to get that thing done and get the hell out of, you know, the situation. So I try to shave off bits and pieces of time. Um, it's important to be aware of how much time you're taking to tell different things in the story. Uh, reading it aloud sometimes helps. Because you see, you know, if you get tired reading your chapters aloud, there's probably too much meat in the chapter, too much stuff there. And that's getting in the way of the pace rocketing forward. Uh, and the need for haste. I mean, there's a, there's a bunch of different ways that's played out in popular books. If you ever read uh, Thomas Harris's Red Dragon, I mean, it was all about racing against time to stop the killer before they kill again. There weren't actually that many deaths in the story. It was, it was that race against time. Can we stop this guy before he kills again? Uh, Seven is the same thing, though, you know, if you ever saw the movie, it uh, has a pretty awful ending, which is a nice way of twisting that race against time. They do catch the bad guy, but, you know, oops. Um, but other, other versions of this, rescue a kidnap victim before the killers do that person in. Um, uh, catching a criminal in the first 48 hours. I, I like, you know, crime dramas, uh, police procedurals. And so many of them mentioned that in that first 48 hours, if they don't get enough clues or information, the trail is likely to go cold because by then the killer will, will have escaped. They will have had time to cover their tracks. They'll have had time to establish an alibi, et cetera. And they may never catch the person. Um, uh, same with, with kidnap stories. They have to happen in a short period of time because kidnappers generally don't take a victim and hold them forever. They hold them for a day or two or three because they're afraid of being caught by the cops. So the ticking clock in that, that type of story is both the race against time to rescue the, the kidnap victim, but at the same time, there's, a, there's also a ticking clock for the kidnappers. If we get inside their head and feel their tension, that adds a whole new dimension to the story because now we're, you know, not like we're rooting for them, but there's still a bit of human empathy we have for characters, even kidnappers, especially if as we get to know them, we start seeing maybe there's a reason they're doing this kidnapping, you know, and that's the sort of thing that you can unfold in plot points later on. Like, like maybe by kidnapping this person, um, they're, they're going to try to uh, prevent that, that person, say father from, um, uh, doing something horrible, you know, with a bioweapon or a crime being committed or, or something. There's other, a lot of the ways it can play out. Another type of need for haste, um, you're in a locked room or a car that's submerged in water. Can you get out? Uh, that movie, 47 Hours, about the, the guy trapped, you know, uh, it was a true story, um, trapped and he had to cut off his own arm to get out. That's, that's a race against time. He actually goes to an extreme to save himself, which he does, you know, but it doesn't look like a winnable situation. And that's kind of the fun of these things. Um, uh, being trapped in a house, trying to escape before a killer returns, like trapped in a, in a, in a basement before the killer returns. Or in a non-killer story, if you're trapped in a house that's, that's on fire, can you get out? Or a building that's on fire, can you get from the top floor down to the, 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 the ground floor without using the elevators, which you can't use in a fire, et cetera, et cetera. And also there's the, the, the 
kind of the generic thriller thing. If I don't get this flash drive to the president, it's curtains for the free world, you know, that sort of thing where you have to, you know, race against time to, to get information that would prevent something. Um, and there's a lot of different voices you can use to, to make the story personal enough or complex enough, and depending on where you want to go with it, so that the reader feels more tension. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, third person omniscient. I was I love third person omniscient. Um, there are times when the, the the narrator, the voice of the book itself, is talking to the the reader. And um, a good example of this, Stephen King's Salem's Lot, one of my favorite horror stories. There was a scene where where the 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 bad one of the bad guys, um, Straker. He's the kind of the human servant of this vampire. It's kind of like the Renfield to Dracula. He's He's the, the Renfield to uh, Barlow and he's, he's abducted a child and he's taken the child. And up to this point, we think, you know, they're going to rescue the child or something. And he brings him to a, a, a kind of an altar and we're dreading the revelation of what he's going to do to this child because, you know, it's a horrible thought. What the re the writer does to make that such a, a, a lingering tension is at the end of the scene, as he's offering a child who's still alive, by the way, the last line of that chapter was, it became unspeakable. Now, that's beautiful in terms of writing, horrible in terms of what the reader is imagining, because there's nothing that Stephen King could have written in that scene that, that would have matched my thoughts about what an unspeakable thing Barlow could be doing, you know, to offer this kid up. Um, that sort of hook does, does two things. One, it's a great thing for tension, because if this guy is doing something unspeakable now to bring a greater evil in, what will that evil do? Oh, my God, dread. Dread is a form of tension, you know. So we're amping up the tension, knowing that something big and bad is, is about to come. Um, but also it invites the reader in to co-create the story. And if we can get the reader to fill in some of the blanks we deliberately uh, create, the reader is now emotionally and intellectually invested in the story. They want the story to unfold and they, they think they, they know what happens here, here, and here. So they're, they're right with you all the way up to the end. Um, that's that kind of, of subtlety of structure doesn't feel like it's tension, but it builds so much tension in. In um, one of my favorite all-time novels, the, uh, the Haunting of Hill House by Shirley Jackson, the opening paragraph, do yourself a favor, go look up, you know, when you have a chance, the opening paragraph of um, The Haunting of Hill House. The very structure of it, even though it's written in an elegant, um, uh, very, actually very elegant voice, it implies so much. And then when we read the book, we find that the implications are left up largely to us to understand and, and fill in. By the end of that book, you still don't know whether it is a haunting or a character going through psychological disintegration. In either case, the process of getting that character and the supporting characters to the end is, is traumatic in a lot of different ways. There's a reason that book is regarded by most horror writers as you know, our gold standard for suspense. Um, it is just an elegant opening. It's fantastic. Um, third person, uh, first person present is also, you know, it's pretty common. I use that a lot in stories. A lot of people use it in stories because if, if a character is describing their own story going through a, a race against time, a mystery or something, <clears throat> their person, that character's personal involvement is a, both a proxy to let, let us feel what they're feeling. And of course they're feeling tension and nervousness, stress, anger, determination, all these things. But at the same time, it's also an invitation for us to be in that, that character's skin. And if we can inhabit that character's skin, it's now personal to us. And this is an important point. If you are writing a, a thriller of any kind and the, the reader does not feel a personal investment in the protagonist, you're not writing a successful thriller. They're not going to, I mean, they, they may find it entertaining, but you want them to be able to walk away from that book and carry the story with them. 
that's 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 really key because then you have reached the reader himself or herself without uh, in, in a bigger way than just merely uh, writing a book that they found enjoyable. They're involved in it. They talk about it later on. A great example of this was Da Vinci Code. Um, Dan Brown, and I'll mention Dan Brown later on too. Dan Brown wrote a book that was so compelling that a lot of people related to the story. They, they, they felt that they were there with him. And it's one of the reasons the book became a huge bestseller and you know launched a whole series of movies. There's now a, a TV series prequel to it, The Lost Symbol. Um, people love the idea of a character who's not only an expert at what they're doing, but is, but is emotionally involved. He cares about the story and its impact, impact, not just on politics or religion, but on the people caught up in all of that. And we feel that in the book. It's a little side note. Uh, Dan Brown often gets uh, uh, punched around by, by reviewers because they thought the Da Vinci Code was, you know, it's, it was cotton candy. You know, so many short chapters and, and, and you know, all those narrative hooks. Um, those reviewers are clueless. In, in a great way, because that book reshaped thrillers since then. Since Dan Brown had The Da Vinci Code, um, the bestseller list has been crammed with thrillers every week since. And so many writers have adopted the style of those short, punchy chapters, those narrative hooks, and that driving pace. That pace never lets up in the entire book. There are, I mean, even, even when there are pauses to rest for the moment, we know that the end of that chapter is going to, going to light the fire again. It, it's a great book to study, to read, if you want to be uh, a successful thriller writer. And in fact, one of, the, one of the things I really recommend is find a couple books that you have read that you really enjoy the pace, the tension, and so on. Read them again as a reader, and then go back and reread them once or twice while making notes as a writer, deconstruct them, figure out the carpentry of how that tension, stru that structure of tension was built. You'll learn a lot from it. Um, that, that's one, uh, Pete, Pete Duderman did one, I think it was called Spider Mountain. That was a really great action thriller. James, uh, James Rollins, uh, I think it was Black Lightning, it was called. It was a really great thriller. Um, the, you know, there was, of course, Thomas Harris's Silence of the Lambs and, and uh, Red Dragon were, were brilliant. Books that endure and are talked about continue to sell well decade after decade do so for a reason, because they've hit a formula. A lot of the criticism of books like that and of Dan Brown came from people who were not writing in that rapid style and resented him for doing something that they did not do. It's, it's jealousy. Very much like all the people who attacked Stephanie Meyer for the Twilight books saying, oh, that, that's, you know, that's awful. They, they sold millions of copies and they, they broadened the uh, scope of who could then start selling novels in that zone. Um, and it's also probably not, probably not a good idea for any, any writer to spend time criticizing, openly criticizing someone else's books, especially those that have been very successful. All right, going back to voice. I also like first person omniscient. And I'm gonna use another Stephen King example here. In the novella, The Mist, which is a brilliant novella, or short, I'm not actually sure, it might be a short novel, it might be over 40,000 words, but it's very short, shortest of his novels. And, and um, there's, you know, it starts off with, with this storm that, that, that impacts this small community, you know, lakeside community, and uh, the husband and their son decide to go into town and get supplies, powers out and so on, leaving um, this guy's wife behind. And you expect that family to be the core of the story. But as he's driving away, before we know any of the really bad stuff that's going to happen, as, as he's driving away, the last line of that chapter is, and I never saw her again. You know, it was totally unexpected. You know that if he never saw her again, something awful is going to happen, either to her or to him or to the world or to all of that. And we are now going to turn that friggin' page because Oh my God, what does that mean? He spent time, in fact, a leisurely pace, building up the relationship between husband and wife, the family dynamic, their personalities. They were real people before that father and son left. And that woman, the, the female character, was as real and as, as vital to the story as any uh, co-priest would be. Uh, 
And then she's gone from the story. That's brilliant. That's also daring, too, because a lot of writers get so sentimental about their characters. They're afraid to take a character out of the story or to have something bad happen to them without necessarily giving all the explanations. But this is an example of, of a, <clears throat> a writer at the top of his game making a decision that really amps up the story. And of course, that story, if you ever read it, the movie ends differently than the, the, the story does. There is no payoff <clears throat> at the end of the story. We're, in, we're left wondering what the hell is going to happen next. You know, this, the, the people escape the town and they, they wind up at a, at a hotel out in the, you know, on the highway somewhere. And they, the one guy maybe hears a little bit of, um, of a radio signal about another town where it's, is it safe? Is it not? Are people saying Hartford is safe or are they saying don't come to Hartford? We don't know. We only heard a fragment, but you know, that's where they're going to go next. It leaves way open. And that is another tension because I walked away from that story writing the next part in my head. <clears throat> now, going back to, to uh, Dan Brown, he's an example of what, I, what are called dramatic beats in a story. Dramatic beats are those moments where something key happens. It doesn't necessarily need to resolve in that moment, but it happens in that moment. And in the old pulp magazines, Doc Savage, The Shadow, The Spider, all those pulps. I love the pulps, by the way. <clears throat> in those magazines, you often had little short chapters with these little tiny narrative hooks. Um, you get to the end of a chapter, um, guy sitting alone in the room, and then the, the doorknob of the closet begins to turn. Now, that's the end of that chapter there's a really good chance you're going to turn the page and find out what the hell is coming out of the closet because it's a frigging closet. Who's turning the doorknob? Oh my God. It's a great setup. Sometimes in the pulps, you know, the lesser writers writing for the pulps overused in ways that were silly. And you saw it. I don't know if any of you are old enough to have watched at least the reruns of the old movie serials. You'll see, you know, one of the heroes on a train and he's trying to get off the train and the train goes over a cliff and explodes. And then, you know, we think, oh, my God, you come back to the theater next week to see the next part of it. Turns out he jumped off. Now that's a cheat because he clearly did not jump off last week. It's a cheat that he did now. You can't cheat the reader. You can have some deceptions, but those deceptions need to be plot uh, relevant, not just there to, you know, for, for a trick to make somebody turn a page. The story has to have integrity in itself. It has to be honest with it and therefore not make a fool of the reader. Um, the dramatic beats, the best explanation for dramatic beats I got was from a writer named Harlan Ellison, who I knew when I was younger. Um, when I was 13, he gave me a really, really great example of dramatic beats just in the way the page looks when you were looking at it. He said so many writers, you know, especially when they're writing an action scene, they're afraid of breaking the tension by breaking the big paragraphs up into smaller sections. And he said, that's exactly counterintuitive because in drama, things are happening all over the place. And that big gray block of text looks sedentary. And often when we're reading a fast scene, an action scene, if I see big blocks of text, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid it's gonna be an info dump. I tend to skim to where things start happening again. So what Ellison suggested is, he said, imagine that those big blocks of texts are like um, traditional jazz music. A melody is created, it's handed off by one, uh, maybe by the piano player to the bass player to the drummer and so on. Each does a variation, it comes back and they all play it together, boom. It's great background music. You can actually write what with that in the background. But if it was improvisational jazz, there's no way you can use that as background music. Because if one person hands it off to another, that person may not even follow the melody line. They may do twist it into some new shape that is only possible with their instrument and their understanding of the instrument. Therefore, they're creating a new unexpected moment within that song. And when they hand it off again, same thing, same thing. And even when they come back together, the planned denouement of, this, of, of the, that piece of music may be different than is anticipated. And that's why improvisational jazz demands your attention. So the way he suggests is take your paragraphs, 
break them up into smaller paragraphs, even single sentences, even single word paragraphs, even break your chapters up. Um, I had a, a chapter, I had a book I wrote called Dead of Night, where the first entire first chapter was, this is the way the world ends. Boom, that's the entire first chapter. Um, you have to you have to turn a page to find out why. Um, I, I, and by the way, I love short chapters. My my, uh, I'll give an example of my of Joe Ledger's first appearance in uh, Patient Zero. The entire first chapter. If you have to kill the same terrorist twice in one week, there's either something wrong with your skills or something wrong with your world. And there's nothing wrong with my skills. Now that was the entire first chapter of Patient Zero. It doesn't tell you the plot. It only tells you one element. He had to kill the same terrorist twice in one week. What does that mean? Is it supernatural? Is it scientific? Is it mistaken identity? What is it? Let's go forward and find out. The reason I, I mention that is because of, it was my fourth novel. It was the first time that the reviewers really got excited about the book because they kept pulling that first chapter. They would actually reprint the entire first chapter in their reviews because they said this launched them into the story or some variation of that. I learned from the review of when I had done something right. That's important. It's why it's good to read um, some of the better reviews and a, and a scope of them, of the books that you really like and see what, the, what the, the informed reviewers are saying about it. I'm not talking about Amazon reviews because they're hit or miss. Um, but you definitely want to use those dramatic beats. There's little narrative hooks. Um, now, you can also use this beat structure for breaking up a scene. So not only do you break up a big paragraph, if you have an action set piece that's that you know is going to take some time to unfold, think about using doing it the way the better filmmakers do if they're telling a complex uh, movie. You'll have a certain amount of, of the A storyline getting to a certain point. They'll cut it and they'll go somewhere else. Um, they'll tell another story, another plot line. Maybe it's parallel to that, or maybe it's another thing where another type of tension has happened to another character, and then they'll come back to this. Um, how many of you ever watched uh, uh, Return, uh, the Lord of the Rings movies? Great show of hands. Okay, so uh, the Battle of Helm's Deep and the Battle of Pelennor, uh, Pelennor's outside of uh, Gondor both use this editing structure to great effect. More so than the way it was in the book, because the, the book stretched out these scenes. So you might have um, uh, Theoden, you know, riding in with his troops, and, and this is happening. Then he cut over to what another character is doing over here, and then Theoden is being attacked by by the war. And then you cut cut to an, uh, another battle over here, and you know, what you have is multiple point of view characters that each one has their own tension and drama moments, but it but combined. They make the overall set piece breathless because all these things are happening at the same time, all of them are. Because if any of these characters fail in what they're doing, the stakes get worse for the, the good guys and the bad guys have advantage. So you're constantly shifting around from different points of view. Thrillers that have ensemble casts, um, which I love, I love writing, um, tend to allow for that type of storytelling. So there are two ways of doing it. One, you might just break a chapter up into multiple chapters, finding a nice tension moment to say, boom, end of the chapter. Even though the, ne the, chap the next chapter starts on the next page, that moment of taking a breath before the plunge is what happens when you go to that next page. And, you know, so you can have a string of chapters, you know, unbroken string of chapters that parse out the tension within that. The other way of doing it, if you have multiple plot lines, you cut back and forth and you can do it either with short, a bunch of short numbered chapters or sometimes you have a bunch of num bunch of numbered chapters and then when you get to this big set piece you just have tension breaks within it or uh, so you'll, you'll have like uh, maybe four paragraphs of this and you'll have a double space blank and you, then a character switch a little bit of that character switch back to this character switch back to that so that what we see is are both plot lines happening at the same point? In multiple storylines, this is critical because if you if you tell one storyline and another, then go back and tell another complete storyline that gets to the same basic conclusion, you've just slowed the pace down. But if you're going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, they are dovetailing together. It's like two missiles about to hit one another. 
and bam, they finally do. That kind of tension is really, really critical. And it, it really amps up pace. Um, now, setting expectations, you know, uh, is a great way of building tension. I'm going to kill the hostages in one hour if I don't get that helicopter, you know, or werewolf story. The full moon is rising and maybe the characters aren't aware of it, or maybe the werewolf is and, and, and wants to flee before he turns into a wolf werewolf and kills the people he loves who are right there. Um, you know, there's a lot of different ways of, of that, that, uh, that time burning off. Um, they vampire stories for some reason the heroes always seem to go to the castle at sunset i would go in the morning dressed in a in a, in a, in a three-piece suit covered in crosses after drinking four gallons of of uh, garlic juice and uh, maybe a, a holy water spritzer but i do that in the morning but in the movies they tend to do it late at night i would rather um change that dynamic if somebody's going to the vampire's place and they're going, you know, prepared for it, they get there and they find out, oh, well, uh -oh, oh, crosses don't work against this type of vampire. Or I only thought crosses work because I read it in a book. Turns out not so much. Or hold a cross and the Jewish vampire goes, nice try. Or some other variation of that where the, the expected plan doesn't pay off. And the reader, who is probably filled with the same sort of um, preconceptions as the character, is stalled by, oh my God, the cross isn't going to work. The silver bullet's not going to stop the vampire. Um, what now? And then we have that nice new direction where the reader who has caught up with us, we've now gone somewhere else for them to have to follow. Um, there are some of these uh, things like, it, it, there's an in the moment uh, sort of tension, an action sequence that delays the protagonist from getting somewhere important. Um, you see, you know, every once in a while you'll see a story or read a story where uh, they, the cop is trying to get up there um, to re rescue the, the, uh, the, the kidnap victim or whatever, but they wind up getting into a fight. I was watching a, a, a TV movie recently, a British cop story, um, where they were going to, to, to a house to, 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 they thought to find the answer to all this. But then the villagers around that house stopped them from going there. And we're thinking that doesn't make sense because the villagers would have been victims of what was going on there. Why would they be trying to stop us? Oh my God, what don't I know about this story? It was a really great scene. The, the hero had to deal with that and then go inside. And, and because of the, the new dimension of that scene, when, the, when she went inside, everything from that point was 10 times more tense because now the story has been reshaped and the character's understanding of it got reshaped. And now, also, situational tension. It's getting really hot in here. It's getting really cold in here. He's coming up the stairs, and will he find me under the bed? Those moments. Um, Dean Koontz wrote a book called Intensity that combined all three of these, the expectation, the in-the-moment, and the situational tension in a beautiful way. If you ever want to read a, a rocketing personal thriller, all point of view of the main character, Intensity is one of the best. Now, what you do want to avoid is rinse and repeat. You don't want to have to, to do the same sort of set pieces you've seen in other books. Um, unfortunately, that happens, and you want to try to avoid it as much as possible. Um, okay, so let's go on to uh, stretching the moment. I love stretching the moment things. We're safe. Oh, my God, we finally escaped that, you know, that zombie. Let, you know, we're hiding out in this, in this house. Oh, crap, there's 10 more zombies upstairs. Um, there's other ways to do that, of course, but the moment when the character feels like they can take a breath is the moment where you should amp up the tension again. But you need to get it right. I just watched a, a TV series uh, last week called Chapel White. It was based on a Stephen King story. It was expanded. Adrian Brody was in it. I loved it, except for one episode that was truly stupid. Um, there are a whole bunch of vampires about to attack this big manor house. It's a big, big house, right? There are three or four people inside armed, uh, you know, to, to, to repel them. And you see them, you know, at one window and you see some of the vampires coming in. They're able to chase them off with, you know, guns and so on. Why, you know, if there are only three or four people, truly how many windows in that house, how many rooms in that house can they truly protect at the same time? Mm. And like the, something might be happening in another room and this person leaves this room, even though we just saw there are vampires outside, leaves that room to go help that, you know, person why don't the vampires just climb up and get in? Why don't the vampires set fire to the house and drive them out? 
don't leave a logic flaw in there. Um, and logic flaws, unfortunately, do happen. And they, they kind of piss me off. I'll give you another example for one of my favorite movies, Aliens. So you have um, all the great, you know, amping up the odds moments. We, we discover the hive queen, uh, the hive rather. We discover that the queen alien is who we've never seen before. Big, bad, you know, wow. Um, Ripley and Newt are trapped in a, in a med bay. Then Newt is kidnapped. The sentry guns are firing. They run out of bullets. And we don't see the, the monsters they're killing. We just see the gun firing and the counter go down. Great. Ticking clock. Um, but then they hit one that's really, really, really dumb. I mean, the setup is good. The, the, uh, the aliens are bad, but the whole complex is about to explode because it's a nuclear processing plant, you know, and boom. So we have that ticking clock, you know, two hours or whatever the time is. is they have to get the drop ship down from, you know, the ship up you know, in the orbit. Why was there no crew left aboard the ship? In the story, every single member of the crew goes down to the planet. There is no military in the world not even Captain Crunch, who would do something as silly as that. Um, James Cameron, you know, wrote the script and thought, wow, that's probably going to be a dramatic moment. But it was so profoundly stupid, so unlikely that it killed a lot of what was going to happen in the tension, if you knew anything about the military, or if you have common sense. It spoiled what, what should have been an even more exciting film because everything up to that and everything after that was great, but that still, you know, it's, it's, it's a stain on the logic of the movie and we don't want that to happen. Um, so boy, we're, we don't have a whole lot of time, do we? Uh, there, let's try to get as much of this in because I want to get some questions in here too. So on that, fact, on that topic, keep it real. Um, you can't mass produce a, a vaccine and distribute it in a matter of hours like they do an outbreak. People can't fight after receiving traumatic injuries. And I'm using more movie references because it's more likely more of you have seen the movies I'm talking about than have read the same books. So, but in Starship Troopers, Denise Richards is stabbed through the shoulder by this big, you know, uh, pincer from, from an alien, a, a wound that would probably have been traumatic or uh, uh, fatal, but even if it wasn't, would have been put her in such shock and blood loss that she'd be laying there twitching. And instead, five minutes later, she's running around firing guns. No, not really. In martial arts movies, for some reason, especially in the 70s and 80s and 90s, they established how bad the villain was, how, you know, how badass the villain was by having the hero lose most of the fight and get his ass thoroughly kicked. And then finally, he has that moment where he'd like... And then for some reason, he uses a special technique, the stupid crane technique from Karate Kid or whatever, and goes in and wins. The amount of physical trauma the character has gone through by that point would not allow them to win that fight from someone who has not, the villain who has not taken that kind of trauma. It's medically unlikely enough that anyone who has ever been injured would go, oh, really? You see it with, with um, action, action characters in books and movies getting shot multiple times, a lot of blunt force trauma, knife cuts. Knife cuts, okay, but it depends on where. I was watching a, a movie not too long ago where there was a knife fight, fight and um, Tommy Lee Jones' character was getting cut on the leg, the stomach, the chest, the arm. They're not bleeding very much. And it doesn't seem to be limiting him because for some reason the knife cuts are all surface, um, even though he's like, ah! But it's all surface because it doesn't prevent him from walking, moving, jumping, swinging his arm, and so on. That kind of stuff is silly, and you should really avoid it. And if you don't know how a fight scene actually works, go ask somebody who knows how to, you know, um, like I'm, I'm a martial arts guy, so I actually advise people on fight scenes. But there are a lot of folks out there who know how to, how to write a good fight scene. Go ask somebody who gets it right. And then, you know, hopefully they'll ask you about something that you know so you can get they can get it right. So summing summing up, I know there's a lot of stuff to dump on you in, in – uh, short period of time, um, you want to have, you want to understand what the consequences are in a story. Uh, and they can be, you know, the consequence of not being able to stop that bomb from going off metaphorically. Um, but also there are consequences along the way. A character could, um, like a, a, a female character going into a building to save a kid from kidnappers, right? She beats the bad guys, kills them, um, but there are more coming, right? She saves the kid. 
Well, see, now she has to carry the kid and protect the kid, which we've already shown how tough she is. But now we're increasing her vulnerability by limiting the things she can do. See, that's much more interesting than having a character just deal with a gunshot wound and have, you know, maybe, you know, protect that arm. They're protecting something else, a child or a person, um, you know, like an adult, rather. Uh, they're, they're doing something where they are having to be the immediate caregiver, shelter, literally the shield against harm while still effectively fighting what we know are increasing and escalating odds. That's awesome. That's really great. I'll be giving a talk tomorrow, by the way, on the nonfiction backstory of fiction. Um, and a lot of this uh, will be going into how to make some of these, these tension scenes uh, really pop by having the kind of information that's real world that people can uh, relate to directly. All right. Uh, so we're going to, to jump over. I know we don't have that much time, but if anyone has any questions, there is a mic right there. Please ask me a question, um, and we'll try to address what you specifically need to know for this. So let's let's do that as quickly as possible. I have a, a question that uh, kind of throws a wrench into things here. Um, what about the nonfiction non backstory? How do you add thriller to a nonfiction book? Oh, there's a great book called Virus Hunters, uh, which is about the Ebola. Um, outbreak, and it was, I believe it was uh, made into a TV movie somewhere or TV series, but that's nonfiction. It's, it's narrative nonfiction. So you're writing the nonfiction, but not giving away all the information. In most nonfiction books on a topic, say it's about viruses, you're going to know in the introduction, the first couple of chapters, you know, what went on because the, the credentials of the author will be, and I helped, you know, I was part of the team that, that, that cured that, you know, but in narrative nonfiction, it unfolds like a novel. You still use the same bits of tension. You still parse out information only when it needs to drive the narrative forward. You still have to have the full payoff at the end because it is nonfiction. But the path to get there, in, in, in especially in narrative nonfiction, unfolds like a novel. And there are some really excellent examples of that. You can also have um, entertaining episodic nonfiction like Parasite Rex by um, uh, Carl Zimmer, one of my favorite nonfiction books. Each chapter sets up its own threat, own, own type of, of uh, disease, explores how that disease is in our real world, and then leaves you totally creeped out and may or may not give you information on how that is treated or prevented. Um, it becomes an entertaining read. Alan Weissman's The World Without Us does the same thing. Those are books that, that give a really good spin to narrative nonfiction. Anybody, we have time for another question or two. Anyone else? So you've learned everything about the ticking clock. You're ready to go out and write your New York Times bestseller. Wow, good for you guys. That's that's impressive. Um, in the last couple of minutes, just just some things I want to add to this. Uh, do, do we do? No, we, we have somebody leaving. Not a question. I should cry. Um, so twisting expectations is always a fun thing. With skilled readers, and and by skilled readers, I mean those people who read a lot in the same uh, genre zone they're going to catch up with you at some point. They're going to, to find the clues that you've laid and you should be laying some clues. So you should have a backup plan, uh, what we call the second bomb. Uh, they, they, they get to the code uh, to DR the uh, first one and then the next one is in the next room or it's a bigger bomb or it has a shell casing that they can't open it or something. There's some other threat. Um, I did that in a, in a book called Assassin's Code, where the nuclear bombs that the hero found were actually fakes, um, or, or they, they weren't armed at all, but it was a trap by, by the villains, and it brought all the heroes into what should have been an unwinnable situation. And um, that became a fun thing to write, because at the point at which the hero, Joe Ledger, realizes that this bomb is not, not even armed, you know, you're going... Uh oh, and then of course he turns around and they're the bad guys, and there's a lot of them. That that allows the reader to have an oh shit moment. We love those oh shit moments. And by the way, in comics, they're actually called oh shit moments. Actual industry term. You get to that moment, and and something happens, and it just completely twists expectations. I did it when I was writing Black Panther comic for Marvel. Um, I was writing it during the time when T'Challa was injured. 
you know, uh, he wasn't able to be the Panther. So his sister stepped up to be the Panther. And there are a couple of oh shit moments because, you know, in the comics, she was not a scientist. She was basically the Lindsay Lohan of Wakanda. You know, she was not a heroic figure and she has to become one. So I kept giving her moments where she'd be up against increasing odds um, that she should never have been able to, to beat. And we see her leveling up because of her brother being an example, the technology she has, her, her emerging inner courage, her, her need to do this for her people, which brings out brings her out of the person that she had allowed herself to become into the hero that, that she is becoming. Those, those moments of tension change the direction of the story, both for the reader and for the character. And that is just a whole bunch of fun. Um, now, how much time? Are we out of time now? Yes or no? Yeah, you're out of time. I've, I'm, uh, okay. So again, I invite you guys, if you have additional questions, I know it's a lot to cram in. It's usually a two-hour talk. Um, please don't, don't hesitate to reach out to me via email, Jonathan underscore Maber at yahoo.com or through any of my social media. If you have questions, I'll be happy to answer your questions. Go have a wonderful rest of your convention and hopefully I'll see some of you tomorrow in the two, two programs I'm teaching. Take care.